um, 7.3, question 55. There's something I'm not sure about. So to be 98% confident, if I if there's some, I would normally make it like this, and then I go, oh shit, I didn't really know this standard deviation. I'm not really sure about the. I don't know why I just said all the standard deviation. I'm not really sure about it. I better make it a little bigger just to cover myself for that. Does that by itself make sense? We're not getting into the all the math behind how the T scores were totally invented. We're just using this guy's work, the guy that worked at the Guinness Brewery. Brewery. Um, and you can see the idea in the formulas. What is that a formula for right there? Interval. Confidence interval for a population mean. For a population mean, I know. When I know sigma. So when I know sigma and it's normal, I can use a z-score. When I don't know sigma, when I only know s, I must use a z-score. This is going to be on your formula sheet. This is a note to yourself that you're not allowed to use, but I have to let you use formulas, so oh shit, i got to let this note through. When do I use t? When I only know s. And of course it has to be 
normally distributed to use anything. So you've got to be normal to do anything, and then you look to see which standard deviation do I know. Okay, so looking at this handout, Uh, let's see. Let's redo these at the beginning at the top. So remind me, what, what's DF? What the hell does that stand for? Uh, That's the formula for it. What's the stand for? Degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom. So in this case, the degrees of freedom would be 5, five n minus 1, like you said back right there. n is 6. And I just have to know that so I can use this. Thanks, man. So I can use this chart. So now if I want to be 99% confident. So let's kind of recover a few things. Well, that would look like this here, all right? 99% like that. Wouldn't that be what that looks like? And there would be 99% in the middle. That's the whole idea. Oh boy, that's it for us. How many tails did I just create? Two. Two, okay. So a co any confidence interval is a two-tailed situation. Today we're going to get into situations that could be one tail. And you're like, ooh. So if, if I have a 99% confidence interval, what percentage is in the two tails outside? 1%. So in two tails, there will be 1%. If you go too far and cut it in half, well then in one tail, there will be 0.005. It's the same column. I want that shit. But I normally think this is my confidence interval level. Right? So if I wanted 98% confidence, it would be 2% in the two tails. I would look in this column. And so I want this column, and I stop at 5. That's crazy, because the degrees of freedom is 5, so I get a t-score of 4.032. Normally, we would use a z-score of, of 2.576. We've used 2.575 before as an approximation. You guys might remember that number. But now look, is my sample very big on this first problem? No. Uh, hell no. So I've got to really cover my ass. I go from 2.575 and 6 to 4.032. That's going to push it out way far. Because I've only got five things. How uncertain am I about my S, my, my standard deviation I see in my sample? Very uncertain. I only have five things I'm looking at. Does that make sense? The more I get in my sample, the smaller it's allowed to be because I'm more and more certain about what I'm seeing. So this first one, the T-score was 4.032. Now we are going to do a, a quick example here in a minute of actually making confidence. But I just want you to realize it's just the same work, right? It's the same work. You just put 4.032 here. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Instead of looking at a z-score chart and getting it from there, I'm going to look at the t-score chart and get it from there. But then it's the same work, it's the same little phrase, we are whatever percent confident. So what about this one? Degrees of freedom here would be 100. I want 90% confidence, so which column am I going to look at? No. How much is in two tails? 90% inside, there must be 10% total outside, or 5% in one tail. So again, if I draw 90% confidence, how much is out here? On each side, there's 5%, so there's 5% in one tail, but there's a total of 10% in two tails. So that's why it's the same 10% two tails, or 5% in one tail, and the same column. Please let that be not too bad. It really is kind of nice that it kind of self checks it. Doesn't matter how far you go. And, then, and where do I want to stop? 100. What would happen if I kept going all the way to the bottom? I would actually get what? A Z score. A Z score. Kick ass. So when it gets large, the T scores become Z scores because I don't need them anymore. If I've got a large sample, then I'm completely fine with what I see. I can use the same number I would use as a Z score, it becomes a Z score. But here I got to stop at 100, I would use 1.660. And then this guy, I wanted to do one of these where it's not 
really on the chart. Degrees of freedom here would be 95. 95. So to be honest, I would actually accept two different answers here. The one I hope you would give me is you would go, which column am I going to use here? 98% confidence, how much is outside? 2%, so I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to stop at 95, but there is no 95, Jeff. The shift. So I would hope you would go and be more conservative and use this one. But if you use this one, I'm not going to take points off. Yes, I, I added them and divided by two. Sure. Mm -hmm. I like it. That's even, that's even a little bit better. I love it. It's not a perfect linear, but that's definitely better than either one. Uh, so you can do one of three things there. Right? So if you get that one wrong, I don't know what to do for it. But, so this one should be, where'd it go? 2.368. I would accept 2.364. That's the one for n equal to 100. Degrees of freedom equal to 100. And if you gave me 2.366, average of those two, that's even better. Right. When I took the statistics, they managed to do something called interpolation, which is a little harder than average in the ship, but thankfully we don't do that anymore. Um, these guys, so that's just purely about using the T-score chart. Now this is going to be what's going to happen to you more often than not. Which one do I use, Z or T? So we already, last time we went through, why did we say Z-score for this one? What two things? It has a sigma. It's normal? And it has sigma. I love it. So when I know the population deviation and it's normal, I can use Z-scores. Does it matter that N is only 22? No. Because it was already no. normal. I love it. I could have taken one and been fine. So what Z-score would I use then? Ninety percent confidence. I'm going to use the T-score chart because I'm I'm silly. On ninety percent confidence, which which column am I going to use? One, two, three, four, five. Which one? Fourth. On ten percent and two tails. You see that? Ninety percent confidence means there's ten percent outside in two tails, meaning there's five percent in one tail. I'm going to use this column. And to get a z-score, I'm just going to go all the way to the bottom. You guys are cool with that? Yeah. I know, I know someday in the near future, I'm going to have somebody go, why are we looking at the t-score chart? Is it? Because we freaking live there. This bottom is the z-scores. It's only that bottom? Yes, yeah. only the bottom. And anything above this is, an, is a slightly larger number to cover our ass for not being completely sure, certain about what we see. But when it gets big enough, then we're golden. We don't have to make it bigger anymore to cover our ass, because if it's big enough, I'm, I'm certain about what I'm seeing. Okay, man. So I would use 1.645 Z-score. What about this guy? T-score. Why? Two reasons. Yeah, we only know S. And it's not normal. Well, it's not normal, so that sucks. But, is it actually normal? Yes. Why is it actually normal? Yeah. And it's bigger than 30. Check. This means I can do something. This means I have to use a T-score. Now, how would I find my T-score? What do I have to figure out here? Oh, you're good. All right, so it's 2% on the outside, 2% and 2 tails, and? Good. Degrees of freedom is? 38. So 2% and 2 tails there, and the degrees of freedom is 38. Kabang. 2.429. Now why does this one have this big knot? Yeah, it's not normal to begin with, and the sample size is not big enough to save us. Four less than 30, all, can't do shit in stats one. 
Couldn't do much without the data and stats too either, to be honest. You have to have the data. Is everybody cool with that? So two things that has to happen. It's got to be normal, and then you just see which standard deviation do I know that tells me which score to use if it's normal. This one is good either way you look at it. Sorry, it started off normal, and the sample was big enough to save us anyway. But what score do I use? Which one? Z or T? T. Because I only know S. I don't know sigma, so it's not exactly right. It's an approximation. T score. 99% confidence, so which column do I want to use? The first column. Beautiful. And I want to stop at 60. 2.660. Sure. All right, so let's take a look at a, an example. And actually, I'm going to make this a little bit of a trumped up example. No pun intended. Oh, I don't want to show you that. Ah. So if I tell you this is normal, these are actually uh, random sampling of averages from this class. So what I want you to do, so I told you they're normally distributed, right? I want you to find the 90% confidence interval for the true mean. Now a really good question for me would be, I've got numbers. What do you need for the formula? I need standard deviation and, and the mean, right? And the Z or T you're going to get, because I just told you I want you to make a 90% confidence, right? Let me write it up here. So you've got to figure out, and you got N, you just count them, right? How do you figure out X bar in the standard deviation? What do you do? I like Hugo's reaction. I can't say it. How, what's the quick way we have that I will now allow you to? Because we passed that first test where I made you do the big ass table of x minus x bar business. Yeah. We're past that. So what's the quick way we have now? Some technology because we got shit to do with this numbers. So we just want to get the numbers now. Plug them in the calculator and use. How do you? Get the mean and the standard deviation very quickly. You use one the var stats. One var stats. And this is good. It's a good time to review this because you got to know this. You didn't bring any calculators with me, so if you didn't bring one yourself, you are going to sit there for a little while. Playing along.
see what I see what all these numbers mean. Go to stat, calc, one variable stats. Make sure it's list one. If you have the older one where it just says one bar stats and nothing else, just hit enter because it defaults to list one. This is what I get. I get a mean of 8.8 roughly, and the standard deviation of 11.812. Now, the calculator again, just throw on you guys, the calculator gives me two standard deviations. And you're like, why wouldn't you choose this one, Jeff? Because they don't have a choice. Which one do I have to use? Which one do I have to use? Which one of these do I have to use? Because it is a sample. So the calculator is just a calculator. It doesn't know what the hell I'm doing. It just wasting me to push buttons. So it just gives me both. It's like, here you go, dude. I don't know what you're working with. You got a sample, use this one. All right. Just remind me, hopefully it sounds familiar. We've talked about that before. So my mean is 80.8, let's take it. Standard is 11.812. The other one's the population. Good. It's not impossible that we actually have a small enough population. We just plug it in. We could have a population of 30. And then when I put them all in, I use sigma, because it's a population. This is a sample, though. This isn't all of you guys. So, what's my n? What was n there? Let's see, it's 16. So what's my degrees of freedom? Why am I calculating degrees of freedom? Why do I have to give a t-score? Yeah, I'm going to know the sample standard deviation, and I also told you it was, no, I told you it was normal, thank God, or else we wouldn't be able to do anything, right? That would just be a really evil trick question for me to put somewhere. If they don't notice, they're going to do a lot of extra work. That would be so mean. Are you guys, normally a problem gives me the mean, gives me the standard deviation, that's nice. Now I don't have to. I give you a little sample, you can calculate it yourself. Doesn't matter where this stuff came from, you just plug it in. Can you guys get the T score? Which uh, I want 90% confidence. That means I want 0 0.10 and two tails. What's the T score gonna be? Oh. Wait, I'm confused. So why can't you just have a mean score and bring it in the same thing? So one time? Why can't you just find the Z score? Because the Z score can only be used if I know the population standard deviation. We don't know the population deviation. We just know the sample because that's all we had was a sample. I like it. So just don't forget that. Why were T scores invented? Not because the guy drank too much Guinness, but because he wanted a way to use something if like, he didn't know sigma. This this formula requires sigma. But doesn't it give up the best formula? I love it. So like I said earlier, the poor little calculator doesn't have any eyeballs, has no idea what we're doing. I could put a population into it, or I could put a sample. It gives me both. I have to know which one I can use. What did we put in? We put a sample of grades. So I have to use S. I like it. So there's no choice except to realize which one you must use. Right? Cool. I didn't give you everybody's grade. I gave you a sample of people's grades. So anybody got the T-score yet? Do it again. 1.753. Ooh, we need them. Dissension. So we got 90%. We want this guy here, right? Stop at 15. 1.753. You got to use degrees of freedom, right? You can't look at your N. You got to look at your N minus 1. Oh, shit. What did I just say? <laughs> And now you can just plug what you need in. So here's an example of you had to calculate these two. You know, you had to get your calculator to do it for you. 
And you have to look this up like always, based on how confident they want you to be. And now I can just plug everything in. So I got 80.8, .8, give or take, 1.753 times 11.812 divided by square root 16.
when I can use these squares is this, so the formula for n when I can't would be a t square there, s square there. And again, what effect does this have? Whatever my sample size required would have been if I knew the standard deviation of the population, it's going to be bigger now because t is going to be bigger than it would have been. So again, it's covering my ass for not knowing something. If there's something I don't know and I want to be even less far away from it, closer to it, my error to be smaller, then my sample that I pick has to be bigger than it would have been normally to cover for the fact that there's something I don't know. All right. I guess you know, if you've done this confidence intervals, this one shouldn't be that big of a deal. We've done a lot with this chart here. It's the same idea. Instead of getting a z-score and plopping it there, I get a t-score and plop it there. Okay, so hopefully you understand the nuts and bolts of how to use it and the concept about why it exists in the first place. Not just to torture you. It's just a fringe benefit. Right, before I forget, you know, like, why can't you just forget, Jeff? Let's have a quiz Wednesday. No. Oh. Actually, yeah, the last test didn't include chapter 7, did it? Not officially. So let's see. Let's do 7173 and 81. So remember, this was the one where you do sigma over square root of n, that's for the first time. We did it there. And, of course, this is the one for confident, and this is this one. So I'm not going to have t-scores on there yet. This quiz won't have t-scores. So what I want to focus today on is to start to get into the next chapter. Good. Um, and I, actually, let's do this. It's, uh, we'll do it live. I didn't even have time to look to see if I can find one. We'll do it live. So I think I've done this with you guys once before. See what I find out. Did you get the right one, Jeff? Hitachi kind of sucks. Okay. Okay. So just to show you an example of where we're headed. What's up? Do we get a study guy for the quiz on Wednesday? You never get a study guy for a quiz except for that double quiz. Here. Yeah, this is just nuts and bolts. They're like, so one weird thing I like to do is uh, I'm a stats guy, so we're all weird. Is type the word study into Google and then go to make it in the past week. So any studies that have come out in the past week? Uh, oh shit, let's see. I'm going to have to stop using equal. Let's see what they say here about artificially sweetened beverages and the risks of stroke and dementia. That sounds like a light green. Let's take a look. Maybe, maybe, here we go. Oh, sweet, look at all this. Oh, my gosh. All right, let me point out a couple things. I might not get lucky and get the part that I want, but I can point out a couple things that should look familiar. Can you guys see anything up there that sounds or looks familiar? No way. So we got 95% is the one that's most often used. And that relates to the idea of 5% being unusual outside two steps, two, and within two steps or 95%. So 
So we used two for unusual before, because that's the most often used definition of what's usual versus unusual. So you see a couple of 95% confidence intervals they calculated. What I was hoping to see would be a p-value. I don't see any p-values up there. Let's try one more, and then I'll have to give up on it. See if I can see anything with a study for a journal. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the news is just getting worse and worse. All right, let me see here. Well, this looked like it didn't load very well. All right, screw that. It's got all this extra crap on it. All right, let me see. Come on, come on, give me something. That's the same one. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, beautiful. Okay. All right. We're not too concerned about the, the, it's not as interesting of a topic. Changes in prices, sales, consumer spending, and beverage consumption one year after attacks on sugar sweetened beverages in Berkeley. All right. Good Lord, man. A good use of time. Okay. Um, so let's see if there's something I think we can understand pretty well. Tax path for changes in the med. All right, screw it. So when they try to figure out uh, a change, there was a change. So what they're looking at is they, they implemented a tax, and once you did it have an effect. So normally when they put a tax, like New York City did a while back, I think, they put a tax on certain sizes of, of soda to try to do like some social engineering to, to, to make people not drink as much sweet, so then people are just, you know, you know just getting two things, um, or just getting their own. Um, so they, they see a difference. They see a difference. So see here, they saw a difference related to something. A difference that went down by 0.64 cents per ounce related to something. Are you guys kind of seeing what's happening? So the, in pharmacies, it actually went up. Uh, in independent corner stores, the, the amount spent actually went down, so forth. You guys kind of understand those these numbers. Why didn't you bring it down here, Jim? Like this number here. It went down by 36 cents. Now, if I if I if we do something and then wait some time and then go see if it had an effect, could it have had no effect at all and it just randomly changed? Is that possible? So, like, if you take the SAT and you get uh, some horrible score, and then you take a two-week study group with me and you go do the SAT again and it's higher. Was it necessarily my study group that made you get a higher grade or a higher score? Not necessarily, right? You like that same Or if uh, you use a different uh, fertilizer on your lawn and then the, and the grass starts coming in better, could there have been other things that made that happen? Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, or it might have just by chance, randomly by chance, it might have just started growing better. It had nothing to do with that new fertilizer. Are you guys with me? Uh, okay. So this p value, this p value is everywhere here. See how they're saying p less than 0 0.001, meaning it's pretty damn small. I think there's some differences of p equal to 0 0.0, p equal to 0 0.03. That's not very good. That is the probability that what they saw happened by random chance. I really want you to understand. So the smaller that is, the less likely it was just random chance, the more likely it was actually the fertilizer or my, my study course or whatever. You know, let me say all that again. This is huge. This is oh, so good. So, um, like right here, P equal to 0.49. There's an almost 50% chance that this was just due to random happenstance. So that doesn't prove shit. I want, if I want to prove something, if I want to prove my drug actually have an effect on people, I need that p-value to be small. The smaller it is, the less chance that what I saw was just randomly happening, right? So I could have people that take Tylenol and they're like, oh man, 
takes forever for that to work. And then I give them my drug, and they're like, oh, wow, it was quicker. And, and maybe it's just random. Maybe they actually ate well, or, or they drank well, or, or, or their headache was going to go away anyway. You guys, so that's random chance. But this P value is the probability that it just happened randomly. So the smaller this is, the better for me if I'm trying to prove that I had an effect on something. Or that something that I did or something that happened had an effect. So they're trying to show that this tax change had an effect on certain activities. And they kind of broke the activities out. Bam, 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 bam. So for this one, whatever the hell this shit is, you're about to... No. That's you. That .49? That's screw that. Normally what we want... Generally, what we want is P less than 0.05. There's that 5% thing again. But sometimes people are like, no, I want P less than 0.01. So let me give you an example, another example. Let's say that uh, my fire insurance is really high, right? Because I live kind of far away from the closest fire station. It's kind of far away. You guys with me so far? Some of you guys might be living that. So I don't know. So then they build a new fire station that's way closer to my house. So then I want to prove to the insurance company that it takes less time for fire crews to get to my neighborhood to put out fires. So then I take a sample or whatever. I want to, I want to calculate. We're going to work on how to calculate this. I want to calculate my p-value and show that it is small. The insurance company is going to go, 0.05? No, you need 0.01, sucker. Right? They're going to make it difficult for me to pass the test. Are you guys? So that p-value can change. And that's kind of related to our definition of what's unusual or not, right? So if it could just happen by random chance, that's not unusual. But I really want it to be so far away from what I expect to go, oh shit, it did have an effect. I want my times that it takes the fire trucks to get to my neighborhood to be so much less than they used to be that they're like, oh, that's unusual. That you guys very low. That's unusual. That's evidence that things have changed. Oh yeah, the smaller this p value, and to be, we're going to get deeper into this. And right now, I'm just going to surface. So there are some misunderstandings about p values, and people want to throw them out. But it's just if you interpret them correctly, you're fine. So there's a way to get the zero like that one up there. Where are we looking at? Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Uh, that that either that's a typo, or it was like. You're so far out there, you point oh, 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 oh. Normally, if that's not a typo, they have to define somewhere what they consider zero to be. Well, like zero, we, we assume point oh, 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 two and less to be zero. Does that make sense? I'm pretty sure it's probably just a typo, to be honest. I like that pickup, though. It's good, good, good eyes. All right. How do we feel about this? Like this, would that be good? Yeah. Now, for them, if you're trying to show that there was an effect on whatever this is, and that wouldn't be good. Now, what if I'm trying to show that we didn't change anything? Like, we, uh, we adjusted uh, the times of some courses, and we want to show that it didn't really affect the enrollment. Do you understand? Then I want the p-value to be bigger. So, it, don't be real careful. P-value is small. It doesn't always mean good. It just means that's evidence that something had an effect. And it's good if I want that to be true, and it's bad if I don't. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Be cool. I like it. So, if I'm you right now, you're like, what the shit is this math going to look like? Right? Or maybe not. Or now you are thinking that, because I said that. Um, so, let's try, to, let's try to start piecing together what this whole process might look like. You go, can you grab it, please? Thanks, man. Let's try. Let's do the. Let's try like the fire station one. Let's see if they're going to make up some numbers and see what happens. So that fire station, they just built a new fire station, and um, historically, oh man. Fire trucks to get to them. And now, after they've built 
So they built a new station. We take a sample of let's say 32 instances when they had to come out. Just go with it for me. Hopefully it's a lot and there's a lot of fire in there. Uh, we took a sample of 32 times they had to come out and find x bar to be uh, 19. Sigma is known to be, um, what you got Jeff? I don't know, 10 minutes. So it used to take 25 minutes. They built a new fire station. Uh, took a sample of 32 times, and we find that the mean now, the mean of those times is 19. Now, now why don't they just stop there and go, well, that's proof. It's less. Isn't 19 less than 25? Right? Right? So why, why do I have to do any more? You know, sounds good to me, let's go. No. You want the time of day, huh? No, I had a good sample. The sample was randomly selected different times a day. You want to see the difference? Differences? We're not going to make your confidence at No, we were. Why do I have to find it? Why? Why don't I just stop? 19 is less than 25. Why is that not proof that the times have changed? This is only a sample. It's only a sample. So it's never, a sample's never good enough to absolutely prove something by itself. We have to do something to get a feel for, is that sample really that far away from what it used to be? Or could it just be random chance that I picked 32? See, that's where the p-value comes in. Could it just be random chance that I happened, the last 32 times happened to be quick for some reason? Yes. You guys? Yes, of course it could. If we can calculate what the probability is of that happening, then we can make a determination. If it's really small, we can say, well, that's evidence. Right? So if they tell us uh, we need a p value less than 0.01, which is a pretty strong test, I don't know if you guys are really fully with me. It's going to be harder to prove that because I got a, 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 a harder goal. I have to prove that the probability at randomly is really small, less than 0.01. If there was 0.10, then that's easy to prove. It's a little bit easier to prove that. So, I was to, so the first thing I want you to realize is this is only a sample. I don't care that it's less than that. The fact that it's less than this tells me, yes, I can do more. If this would have been 27, then I go, why the hell would I do anything else? It's not going to be proof that it's less than this. Do you guys see what I'm saying? And, there, and there's like one problem in the book that actually does that to you. And if you see it, just go, I ain't doing shit. <laughs> right? If that's, if that's not evidence at all, then screw it. Why would I do it? Uh, now be careful. Uh, do you, what do you, what's your own personal take on it? Do you think it's going to be proof enough? So what we're really asking is, is 19 less than 25 enough? So what do you think? Is 19 very far from 25? No. Why not? Well, no, that's not really the question. I'm asking you is, so where would 25 go and why can I draw this picture? Why is it normal? Yeah, it's more than 30. So when I draw the means, it should be normal? All right, I like how you're thinking, but what am I going to have to do with this, considering this and this? Yeah, can I use this number? Where'd it go? Here, can I use this number? No, because that's the one that's good for individual times. What am I going to need? The one that's good for 32 times, right? Remember, how did I affect this before? When we took a sample and we asked about the sample mean, what do we have to do to this? Yeah. Five, right, so 
uh, when I take a sample and I ask about the sample means, I have to do this. But in this case, it's uh, sorry, not 10. What would it be? Square root of 32, right? So remember, that's, that's what changes. When I, when I take a sample, all the samples should be closer to the average. Because when I take a sample and I take a random sample, that's going to mean it's going to be a mixing of all the possible values. They should, more of them should be closer to the mean, which means the standard deviation gets smaller. Everything just gets bunched in. That was the whole idea of chapter 7. Um, okay. So, this is where it was. We found this. We need to see how far apart are these. So what can I calculate to figure out how far apart? How do I, what do I use in statistics to measure distance? Z-score. I love it. Z-score measures distance, right? And of course, that's not a good enough answer on the test. Z-score measures the number of standard deviations from the mean to the data point. But what does it effectively do? It measures how far things are apart in a data set. So let me ask you this. If I... Need this to be really much basic. The p value is going to be the amount that's in this tail. Because it's going to be the probability that something happens this far away from the mean. So if I'm really close to the mean, if something happens in here, that's a really high probability. That's does that make sense? So, something near the mean would have a very high probability of happening because that's where we expect things to happen. Something further away from the mean should have a lower chance of happening. So the p-value is actually that area in this tail. I'm trying to connect this to stuff we've done before. Yeah. So if it says uh, finds x bar equals 19, does that mean that that's the mean? or That's the sample mean. Okay. Uh, so does that mean that the simple means in the middle? Well, no, 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 no. Historically, it took five trucks 25 minutes. Oh, okay. That's the average that we know. Mm -hmm. So oh, with hypothesis that. tests, here's what we do. We say, okay, let's assume that that's still true. Assuming that's still true, look what I did, right? So this is what they did up here. Assuming that there's no difference, look what we just did. Something really slow chance of it being happening by random a very small probability. So we assume that that is the middle, and we want to show something, we want to see a, a sample that happens so far away from it that there's no way that's the middle. I really want to, so again, we're going to be doing this a few times over. So there's a, there's a historic mean, there's like an understood mean, there's something, the mean was this, the mean score in the SAT was this, and then they took a class, and now here's what the mean was after. So that, that original mean is going to be in the middle. 